In the previous chapter, we solved the problem of finding the resistance between two points on an infinite grid of one ohm resistors. We got an expression that is an integral over two periodic functions. This is our result. If we plug in values for the coordinates of our grid, this is m and n, and then integrate over a period of alpha and beta, we get the resistance. Since the function is periodic in alpha and beta, we could also integrate over 0 to 2 pi. With numeric integration, we already checked that the integral works. Now we want to find an analytic solution. Since the integral is rather hard to solve, we limit our view to the diagonal resistances where m is equal to n. Note that this also allows us to find the resistance that we were initially looking for. Where n is 1, we get R11. In order to find the solution for the integral, we have to use a few trigonometric substitutions. I think it is fair to look them up in Google or some table in a book. If you want to prove them yourself, what is often useful is Euler's identity. Here I use J as the imaginary unit, as we electrical engineers often do, since I is often used for the current. One of the trig identities that we will use in the next step is cosine alpha times cosine beta minus sine alpha times sine beta equals cosine of alpha plus beta. To replace this product of the two cosine functions with a sum, we will use the identity from the last page. The identity allows us to replace the product by a sum, but then we have to add two sine terms. Here I replace the product with the sum, but I left out the sine terms. Why can I do that? The reason is that we integrate over a complete period, or in our case about multiple complete periods, and the sign will cancel out. Remember, our function under the integral is an even function. It is the same for positive and negative values, because it only depends on cosine. A function like sine is antisymmetric in respect to the y-axis, for f of x is minus f of minus x. If we integrate over an odd function, over minus pi to plus pi, then the integral is zero. The negative and the positive parts are the same with opposing signs and thus cancel out. Our initial function is even, and if we multiply it by an odd function, then we get another odd function. You might object that here we have two odd functions, two sine functions that we multiply. But note that the one is in alpha and the other is in beta, and we integrate over those separately. If we integrate over alpha, anything that is a function of beta would just appear as a constant in this integration. Next we will substitute u plus v is alpha and u minus v is beta. This also means that a move in the u direction moves both alpha and beta. This is like tilting the axis by 45 degrees. And since our movement is scaled by the square root of 2 in both directions, we get a factor of 2 here. If we still run our u and v from minus pi to plus pi, our area is twice as large. Also, since the function is periodic, once we leave, our original rectangle and go outside, it is the same as when we enter it from the opposite side. 
So in the end, with the yellow rectangle, we hit every point in the original white square exactly twice. Like you can fold in the corners of the yellow rectangle and get another white rectangle. So we have to multiply with one half because we are moving faster, but also we have twice the area, so in the end the integral stays the same. You can also convince yourself about this if you think of the integrand as a function that is a constant 1. So then the integral just gives the area. With the same bounds of integration, we still get the same value for the area before and after the substitution. This tilted version of the integral gives us another opportunity for simplifications. So here is a new integral in u and v. With another trigonometric identity, we can substitute. Time we replace the sum of the two cosines in the denominator. Instead of using u and v, I switched back to using alpha and beta for cosmetic reasons. Note that we have now an additional 2 at the denominator, and we brought that to the front of the integral, where we divide by 8 instead of 4. Note that now our integral is no longer completely symmetrical in alpha and beta. The beta is only used in the denominator now. With this we could evaluate the inner integral independent of n and for this we want to look at the inner integral which we want to name b. It has this form where in our case the constant k is cosine alpha. A good trick that helps to get rid of nasty trick functions is the substitution of t is tangens alpha half. Or in our case beta half. With this substitution we get cosine beta is minus t squared over 1 plus t squared. And for t beta we get 2 over 1 plus t squared dt. With this common substitution, we get something that doesn't have any trigonometric function in it at all. Note that when beta moves to pi, then tangens beta half moves to plus infinity. So we change our bounds of integration from minus infinity to plus infinity for t. In the denominator, we have a quadratic equation in t. If we assume that k is smaller than 1, then we have two purely imaginary poles at that location. Location depends on k, but is always on the imaginary axis. One convenient trick for solving such integrals is via the residuals in the complex plane. For well-behaved functions, the integral over any closed loop in the complex plane is always the value of the enclosed poles, times a factor of 2 pi j. If there are no poles in the loop, then the integral would be zero. In our case, if we choose a loop like the one shown in the blue curve, then we know that the straight part and the curved part must sum up to zero. When we make this loop bigger and bigger and go to infinity, then the straight line is exactly our integral. But since the value of the fraction goes to zero faster than 1 over x, then we know that the curved part also goes to zero. So the integral on the real axis is then only the sum of the residues at the poles 
on the upper half of the complex plane. In our case, that is just this one pole. The 2 pi g comes from the theorem, and the residue at the pole is just the value of the function with the pole removed, that is, multiplied by t minus the pole. And fortunately, we get a real value for our b integral. So again, this is our b integral. Remember that initially we had capital K is cosine alpha. So this was the result. And if we substitute back K is cosine alpha, we get B is 2 pi over sine alpha as a result for our integral. Remember that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Now back to our original integral. Before we do one more simple trigonometric substitution. 1 minus cosine 2x is 2 sine squared x. Let's apply this in our initial integral. Note the factor of 2 reduced our denominator from 8 pi squared to 4 pi squared again. Now let's apply our b integral. If we clearly divide the inner and outer integral, we have our well-known b integral in the inner part and the outer part is only dependent on alpha. Also note that I replace the bounds of integration so that we start at zero instead of starting at minus pi. This would have the integral, but we can easily compensate by multiplying with a factor of 2 before the integral. In our case, we only divide by 2 pi squared instead of 4 pi squared. And so, we substitute our b integral for the inner integral that was 2 pi over sine alpha. So the 2 pi can be put in front and cancel with the 2 pi squared, leaving just 1 over pi in front. So this is a nice result. Let's appreciate this for a moment. We only have a one-dimensional integral now and a much simpler one as well. Immediately you will notice that for the case of n equals 1, the sine squared over sine simplify to just sine. So we have the integral of just sine of alpha d alpha there. That gives minus cosine and in the bounds of 0 to pi we get another 2 here. So the result is what we were initially searching for, 2 over pi. Yet another trig identity helps us here. Substituting this, the sign in the denominator conveniently cancels with the sign of alpha here, and then we only have the sum of signs in the integrand. We can switch the sum and the integration and only get the sum of minus cosines. Again, the value of the cosines at the bounds are plus and minus 1, and thus we get another 2 in front. So, here we have our result. Note that the sum over the reciprocal odd integers is just half of the terms of the harmonic series. And we know the harmonic series grows with the log of n and we also have already guessed that the r values should grow with the log of the distance. So this seems like a plausible result. So here again the result. 
With this, we can immediately calculate the resistance at all diagonal points. What about other values? So on all the yellow nodes, we already know the resistance. We have the point in the middle and the four nodes where we know that the value is one half. And then we have the complete diagonal lines. To calculate the other values, let's remember the initial formula that relates the values. So the initial formula says we can sum up the four outer points and this is equal to four times the inner point. That means that we can calculate any point if we know four other points. We could do this recursively. If we say the blue point is defined by the four red points, we then only need to calculate these four red points. If we always choose our cross of five points in a way that we go strictly inwards, then the recursive formula will either hit the middle or the known diagonal. Also, when we cross a symmetry line, we can use the symmetry there. There's only one special case. If we are one point away from the diagonal, we no longer go strictly inwards. The point F23 would be required for the point F32, which is no longer strictly inwards. But here it helps that due to the symmetry, the value of these two blue points must be equal. So we can calculate the sum of the remaining three points and half it. This way we continue to go strictly inwards. And so our recursion should work. Let's see some Python code. So this is a snippet from a Python program. It uses SymPy for symbolic computation, but it would be easy to translate it into conventional Python program. The function is called RR for recursive resistance. I placed a Python decorator called addCache in front of this function. This decorator is from the functools and it's used to cache results of functions. When this decorator is used, Python will remember for what arguments the function is already called and will remember the result it produced. So this time, when we call the function just twice with the same arguments, it will only be called the first time and the second time the cached results will be used. This will greatly speed up the calculation. So for the function itself, in the first two lines we calculate the absolute value. Of course this is because of our symmetry. If we get an input of minus m, we can replace it with plus m. From here on, we only need to deal with positive values of m and n. Also, if m is smaller than n, then we just need to flip m and n. Thus, we can always assume that n is now smaller or equal to m. For m and n equal zero, we can return zero. Remember, since here we know that n must be smaller or equal to m, that if m is zero, then we know n is zero as well, and we can return zero. The next case is the one that we initially calculated, the four points around the origin where the value is one half. And then when n equals m, we are at the diagonal and we can just return the result that we have just calculated. 
Now the really interesting part happens in the else branch. In the else part we cover the recursion. We call our rr function inside of our rr function and get values for different m and n. We have our two cases here. The first one is where we are exactly one point away from the diagonal. This is the case where we had two blue dots and where we had to half the result. The second case is just a normal inward moving, where we calculate the outer point from the four inner ones. Notice that we only use m minus 1 or m minus 2 here. We are moving to smaller and smaller m and thus our recursion needs to terminate at some point. Invoking four other values for each value that we calculate initially rapidly increases the number of steps in the recursion. But very soon we will hit either the diagonal line or the center and then the recursion terminates. And since we use the cache decorator from the function tools in Python, Python will remember the results of resistors that have already been calculated. In this small code snippet, I calculate a matrix of 7 times 7 results, and this will be nicely displayed by SymPy in a matrix. So here we got a nice table of exact results. We see our one half value near the origin and the pi over 2 in the first diagonal element and then all the values around this. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you learned something from it. See you soon.